They had the same mother, the same father, they had the same birthday, but they couldn't have been more different from each other. I'm talking about Jacob and Esau. We're in a series where we're, this year, where we're reading the entire Bible, the abridged version of the entire Bible. And uh, I originally put it together because I thought, well, I, I know most people never read through the whole thing. And that they never get a sense of the whole thing. So this is the abridged version. It's about one-third the size of the whole Bible. And it's sort of like the highlights of the Bible. It also uh, probably has 40 different versions or translations of the Bible, too. So when you're done, maybe you'll figure out which version that you like. So we looked at the story of Abraham, uh, we looked at the story of Isaac last week, and the theme last week was that God will provide, and that's true, God will provide, and whatever you're going through right now, God will provide, not always in the timing and in the way that you would like, but uh, as Scott said, for His kingdom and His glory. In fact, really the whole Bible, that's the theme of the whole thing. God will provide. Every week I could just say a bunch of stuff and then at the end just say, well, and God will provide. And uh, that would be true. And it's true about today's story of Jacob and Esau as well. But what I want to do this morning is a little bit different. I want to look at Jacob and Esau as sort of a case study. They're two brothers. They're very different from each other. They have different reactions to uh, the things that happen. And maybe you can relate more to one, or maybe you can relate uh, more to the other, or maybe sometimes you relate to both of them. So the story starts out, uh, if you have your sampler Bible with you, uh, it's on page 24. Uh, it starts out, verse 21, Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And that's a theme often uh, with these large characters in the Bible. And I think in part because God... Uh, wants to communicate to them that he is in charge, and he's in charge of the blessing, and it's his timing, once again, that God will provide, but in his time, and you have to just trust uh, God. So he prayed, and she does conceive, and she has twins, and they're fighting inside of her uh, so much so that she, she exclaims uh, to God, what's happening to me? And then God explains that there's two nations that are fighting uh, and that the older one will serve the younger one. So then we have the description of their birth. Uh, when her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his body was like a hairy cloak. So they named him Esau. The, word, the name Esau means red. Or uh, sometimes the translation is Rudy. King David was described as Rudy. And, and that's another word for being strong. And it's almost as if um, Jacob and Esau were fighting in the womb as to who go, comes out first. Because in that culture, whoever is born first gets a double inheritance. So we're talking, I mean, this is a big deal, a double inheritance. Uh, back in that day, it's good to be the firstborn. Today, it's not so good, because if you're the firstborn, it means your parents basically have you as an experiment, because they have no idea what they're doing when they're parenting. I am a firstborn. Anyone else here is a firstborn? Okay, let me look at, okay, that explains a lot of things about some of you. Some parents got it right, some parents didn't. But in that day, being a firstborn meant, uh, you know, a big, huge advantage, and it's almost as if they're fighting as to who comes out first, and the first one to come out is Red, Esau. He's the strong one. What I picture is a, uh, uh, Esau with a Cabela's camo onesie. Uh, he's got a full beard. He's got a cigar in one hand and a gun in the other. And he's like, you know, what's happening? That kind of guy. He comes out, he's large, he's, he's, he's the one in charge. But they notice that the second one has got a hold of his heel. Little, you know, and Jacob, as we'll discover, he's not hairy, he's not the Cabela's guy, he's more of a, you know, Hobby Lobby kind of guy. And 
You know, he's got a hold of his heel as if to say, you know, no, you don't, Esau. I'm coming out first. And, you know, of course, Esau's bigger, stronger, knocks him down, and he comes out first. But Jacob, and so they name him Jacob, and the name Jacob means overreacher. He's not the firstborn, but he wants to be, and he's going to do what he can to uh, take that uh, first spot, which is interesting because both of these kids sort of live up to their names, which means you have to be careful as parents as to what kind of name you give your child. You know, at baptism, we name our children, and they have certain meanings, but more than that, because sometimes we name our kids names, but we also label them. So if you are constantly saying to your kid, why are you so lazy? Well, don't be surprised one day if that's what he is. You give a label to someone and often they try to live up to it. So we have Jacob and Esau, totally different people. Then we get a little bit more about who they are as they grow up. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful skillful hunter a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in the tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So Esau, again, he's, you know, Jacob is the kind of guy who has uh, the hardcover um, Cabela's, um, what is it? Uh, What? Catalog, that's the word. You know, they have the hardcover version, right? Am I right, Mark? Don't they? They don't? Well, they got it. You know, my view of you, Mark, is really. So, the, you know, the guy with the hardcover one, of course, every night he's paging through it. He knows every page. He knows what's there already. But every night he pages through it anyway. Oh, yeah. Oh. Camo underwear. Yeah, I got to have that. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, that's Esau. Esau drives, uh, well, no, he doesn't drive a Jeep. That would be too, uh, you know. No. He drives an old Willys. It doesn't have a roof. It doesn't have doors. It doesn't have a seat. Uh, it's got a motor. That's it. That's, and it's got a lift kit. Well, it's got several lift kits where you've got to have a step ladder to, just to get into the thing. That's Esau. Jacob, again, he, you know, he goes to Hobby Lobby. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to Hobby Lobby. I like Hobby Lobby. I'm just saying that's the kind of guy he is. He's not a Cabela's guy. Uh, He hangs around the tents, it says. A little bit later, he's into cooking and soup and so on. It's all good stuff. By the way, what kind of car does Jacob drive? Prius. (laughs) He does not drive a Prius. (laughs) He drives a cabriolet. Come on. Anyone know what a cabriolet is? Google it. It's a Volkswagen, but that's what he drives. He drives a cabriolet, not a Prius. They didn't exist at that time. Come on, people. <laughs> so that's the kind. Now, you know, you, you know, not every guy has to be a Cabela's guy, right? Some guys like Hobby Lobby. Some guys like Cabela's. You don't all have to be the same. All right. Uh, by the way, you know, sometimes our culture sort of has these stereotypes, and it's like, you know, the strong man, he's going to take what he wants. But sometimes it's that quiet guy that actually wins the day. And we'll see how that works in this story. All right, so uh, a little bit later, we don't know when. Esau's out in the uh, hunting and doing his thing, and apparently he forgot to pack a lunch. He comes back home, and he's starving, and Jacob hanging around the tents, making soup. And Esau sees it, and he says, give me some of the soup. And Jacob says, um, you know, he notices that he's hungry. Tell you what, I'll give you the soup, but you give me your birthright. And Esau's going, 
what good is a birthright if I die? I, I got to have food. So, so he takes the food, sells his birthright. And then what it says, thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, that's got to be as dumb as you can get, right? I mean, he's selling his birthright, which is worth tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars. Who knows in terms of that day? He's selling that. I mean, that's the cost of this one thing of soup. Are you crazy? And yet we do the same thing, don't we? We sell our future for the needs of the present. We do that sometimes with the food that we eat or our bodies that we don't take care of. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And yet, because of our need for today, we don't think about the future. A lot of people, when they get old uh, and it, they're hurting in every which way, they often, I've heard many of them say, I wish I had taken care of myself. Uh, if, if I knew I was going to live this long, I'd have taken care of myself. We do this with the things that we buy. We're willing to go into debt which hurts us in the future, pay interest on that debt, for the thing that we want right now. We're willing to give up our relationship with God because we're busy with the stuff that takes our attention or grabs our attention today. We don't have time to read our daily verse and thoughts. We don't have time to uh, pray to God. We don't have time to come to church. We squeeze it in because we have so many things that... that that draw our attention to right now. We often sacrifice our future for our present. Well, that's what Esau did, but what did Jacob do? Maybe you can relate better to Jacob. Jacob is doing whatever he can, manipulating whomever he can to get what he wants. If it's his brother, then he'll manipulate his brother. If it's his father, then he'll manipulate his father. If it's his uncle, he'll manipulate his uncle. He'll He'll do whatever it takes to get what he wants. Even though he's quiet, doesn't look like a guy who's bulldozing his way through, but little by little, but behind the scenes, he's grabbing what he can for himself. Well, then the next story is Isaac. He's old, his eyes are dim, and he wants to give the blessing. And... Uh, he comes to Esau. He doesn't know about that Esau gave away his blessing. So he comes to Esau, and Esau doesn't tell him. Esau is like, you know, whatever. I know I gave you the birthright. You know, I gave it away for this pot of soup, but, you know, that didn't count because I was hungry. Or I don't know what his, uh, his rationale was, but he's going to take the blessing. So he goes off hunting, but Rebecca, Isaac's wife, heard the conversation and she loves uh, Jacob more than Esau. We don't know why. Maybe it was the, what God had said, that the older one will serve the younger one. We don't know. Uh, maybe it's because uh, he, he you know, was cooking with his mom every day. I don't know. But she wants Jacob to get this blessing. And maybe she heard about the, the sale of it uh, with the red stew and so on. I don't know. So she comes to Jacob and says, we're going to fool your dad. Uh, I'm going to make the, the food, and uh, we'll get some clothes of Esau, and you go in there and fool your father. He's blind. He won't know the difference. And, and Jacob says, yeah, but Esau's a hairy guy, and I'm a smooth guy. And how's that going to go? And so she goes out, kills a goat, skins the goat, and then Velcros the goat hair on his arms and his neck. And that works. So you've got to wonder how hairy was this guy, Esau. By the way, women, do you prefer a hairy guy? No. I don't even want to go there. So he goes in, pretends he's Esau, and uh, Isaac ends up giving him the blessing. And then he goes out, and then as he goes out, Esau goes in. He's got the game. He's got the thing. He goes, Dad, you know, here I am. I'm ready. And uh, we read... Jacob says, well, who are you? Well, I'm Esau. I'm your firstborn. He says, well, Esau already went. He was here. And then, and then Esau realizes that it's his brother who cheated him. And as soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he, the father says, well, I'm sorry. Your, your brother tricked me, and I gave him the blessing, 
and that's just the way it is. He's got the blessing, and you don't. And we read in verse 34, as soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceeding great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, my father. Uh, and then, but he said, your brother came deceitfully and is taking your blessing. And Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? Okay, remember Jacob means deceiver, overreacher, always trying to get what is not his. And then at the very end, uh, Esau says words that, that I think a lot of sons and daughters... Uh, can relate to. This is what he says. Esau said to his father, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Now, the blessing that we're talking about here is not just the blessing of the first four. It's the blessing that was handed from one to the next, to the next, to the next, and ultimately ends in Jesus. It's the big blessing. Okay, So part of what's going on is the big blessing. But there's also this little blessing. And the little blessing is the blessing that parents give to all their children. But a lot of times, children don't feel that blessing. So a lot of kids wonder, does my father bless me? Does he, does he think anything of me? Does he think highly of me? Does he think I have a future? And so my little encouragement to you parents is to make sure you bless all your kids. Don't let one of your kids say, have you only got one blessing? And it went to my brother or my sister. I hear a lot of stories uh, that suggest that sometimes we do that. Make sure each kid gets the blessing. And by the way, to bless each kid is different. Each kid is different. For one child, the blessing would be kind of a challenge. They need a challenge. And when you give them a challenge or you give them responsibility at a young age, it communicates something to that kind of person. Or another one needs words. They need encouragement. They need a pat on the head. Hey, you're doing a good job. They need you to actually say words to them. Or they don't know that they're being blessed. Or maybe they need comfort. Every kid is different. But make sure you give all your kids the blessing. Well, Esau doesn't get this uh, birthright blessing, and so he wants to kill his brother. He's, he's obviously mad, and who wouldn't be? I think that, 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 that super anger that we sometimes feel happens when we feel betrayed. When people that are close to us, people that should love us, people that should have uh, our back uh, when we find out that they betrayed us. That hurts probably more than anything else. So Esau wants to kill his brother, and so his brother runs off. And uh, you have to wonder how this was for Jacob. Jacob has, you know, cheated his brother. He's lied to his father, and now he has to run off and Remember, he's a guy that likes staying around the tents, taking his cabriolet and just driving around the village, but he doesn't, he doesn't get out much. So all of a sudden, he doesn't have a car. He's off walking, and he has a long journey to some place he's never been to visit his rel relatives that he's never met. He, they have no idea he's coming. You can't, like, uh, Facebook message them or uh, send them an email, hey, Jacob, coming have guest room prepared. They have no idea he's coming. They have no idea that he even exists. Uh, so how's this going to go? So he takes off, and he's uncertain about everything, and he gets to the middle of nowhere, and it's time for him to go to sleep. And the, the text says that he set up a stone for a pillow. And that's my business idea. It's called the, it's called the Jacob Pillow. The Jacob pillow, think about it. All the pillows out there, they're all the same. They're soft, they're this, they support you, they give you all the comfort that you could possibly have. And is it working? No. People have bad backs, they have bad necks. Right. So why don't we go the opposite direction? This pillow is not comfortable at all. This pillow is going to be tough. 
It's going to be hard. It's going to take a while for you to get used to this pillow, but it's going to change your life. The Jacob pillow. Just call 1-800-72-JACOB today. The Jacob pillow. I think it could work. Anyway, so he sets up this pillow, then he has a dream, and in the dream he sees angels ascending and descending down a ladder to heaven. It's like heaven opens up, and he wakes up and he's so thrilled because it's like God showed up in the middle of his great need. And God, God often does. When you're all alone, when you have no idea what you're doing, uh, you have no prospects, you have no idea how the future is going to go, often that's when God shows up. So God shows up, but notice uh, how Jacob re reacts. Remember, Jacob is the conniver. He's the one overreacher. He's always trying to manip manipulate things to get things. So here's, here's what he said. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. If God blesses me, then he'll be my God. Okay, God, that's your challenge. If you bless me, I'll follow you. If you don't, and then he says this, and of all that you give me, I will give it all back to you. Well, no. If I give it all back to you, I won't have anything. Tell you what, God, I'll give you 50%. I keep 50%. That seems fair. We're both the same. You got 50, I got 50. It's a deal. And he thinks about it. God really doesn't need all this stuff. I need this stuff. God doesn't need bread. I need the bread. How about 60, 40, God? I'll give you 40. I'll keep 60. That seems reasonable. I'm the one in need. And he keeps bargaining and bargaining, and finally, this is what he says. And of all that I get, and of all that you give me, I will give you a full tenth. I'll keep 90, you keep 10. And we do less than that. We do less than that. God gives us everything. And what do we give in return? So he's still conniving, he's still trying to you know, do things himself, make it happen for himself. Okay, so finally he arrives in the town of his relatives and he doesn't know who they are, stops at some well and uh, he talks to the people there. There's a well, there's a big stone. They only move the stone out of the way once a day at a certain time. Uh, that's when, so everyone sits around waiting for that time for the stone to be rolled away. And so he asks, hey, do you know the, the family uh, of, of, of my relative, Nahor, Abraham's uh, uh, brother, and so on? And, oh, yeah, yeah, we know them. In fact, here comes one of the daughters, Rachel, with the sheep. And Jacob sees her with the sheep, and, and that's it. He's, he's like smitten. He's in love. And what's interesting, you've got to remember that Jacob is not the hairy guy. He's not the red guy, he's the smooth guy, hangs around the tents, likes cooking soup, drives a cabriolet. He sees Rachel, and what does he do? He goes over to that stone, it doesn't matter that it's not stone moving time, he goes over there, and usually they have a bunch of people roll in the stone by himself. My guess is he took his shirt off. Rachel. And he moves that stone like it was nothing. Moves the stone away. Are you not impressed, Rachel? And then he meets Rachel, gives her a kiss, and uh, falls in love with her. Goes uh, to uh, the, the uncle's house. He's there for a month working hard. And finally, um, the uncle says to uh, Jacob, look, you can't, you know, you're not going to keep working for free. What do you want as your wages? And uh, this is what he says. I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. And Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. And then verse 20. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. 
And they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Now, ladies, those of you that are not married yet and hope to be married, two things. Number one, if a guy really loves you, he will wait. He will work for you for seven years before he has you. A lot of ladies today, young girls, give themselves away so cheaply. You are a princess in the kingdom of God. Do not give yourself cheaply to anyone. If they love you, they will wait. You want this, then you have to marry this. That's what you say. But that's one thing. The second thing is this verse, or these couple of verses, illustrate something about men. Okay, Jacob, he sees Rachel, he moves the stone, he works for seven years, he writes poetry, he gives chocolates, um, he, he, he spends all night talking and listening to her, and whatever she says is just brilliant, and every joke she tells, he laughs at. He does this for those seven years, but then they get married. And then what happens? No chocolates, no uh, poetry, no uh, staying up all night listening and talking. And a lot of young married uh, women go, what happened? What ha where's this guy that was, you know, motivated and, you know, uh, doing all this stuff? What happened? And, but here's what you have to understand about guys. Guys are one-track mind. When they're into the sporting thing, that's all they think about. The whole world could be under a nuclear strike. But if they're playing a game, the ball, and hitting this ball is, that's all there, there's nothing else in the universe but that ball. So when a guy is dating, I got to get this whole marriage connection to this woman thing. I got to attack this thing. We got to get this done. We got to do all we can to make it happen. And so they do. And then when it's done, all right, that's done. Moving on. What's the next thing? I got to make a living. I got to go to work. I got to do. So that's what they do. That's all they think about. It's like, I got to do this. Are they going to have kids? And all of a sudden they have a kid. And they're consumed with the first one. Second one comes, it's like, we've done this before. Moving on. So if you're the second one, <laughs> it's tough. But anyway, that's what men are like. They're, they're, they're focused, they, you know, and I don't know if that's part of the sin problem or, uh, you know, God made us in, in, in a way, certain ways, but that's what you have to live with, and so men, we have to overcome some of that too. So that's what happens. They get married. Uh, okay, then, then what happens? After seven years, um, they have the wedding ceremony and so on, uh, the, the wedding night. And the next morning, it's, it's so funny to me how the Bible puts it. Uh, um, wedding, ceremony, evening, so on. And then verse 25. In the morning, behold, there was Leah. It's like, I thought I married Rachel. And all of a sudden, I married Leah. So you can imagine uh, Jacob's thinking and, and wonder and perhaps anger and so on. But can you imagine Leah's predicament? I mean, her father must have said, now, I know Jacob thinks he's marrying Rachel, but we're going to do the switcheroo. And Leah's probably going, how's that going to work? You know, because the next day he's going to know. I don't worry about it. It'll all work out. So, you know, you got to think about it from Leah's point of view. So Jacob is upset. Laban, Laban is a deceiver just like Jacob. They're, they're kind of the same. And so he says, well, you know, we had to marry off the first one first. I mean, that's our custom. That's the way it is. I thought you understood that. Didn't we talk about that? <laughs> no, I don't think you brought it up. <sighs> you know, I got so much on my mind, I probably just forgot it. But that's the way it is. So I'll tell you what, you work another seven years, you can have Rachel too. So that's what Jacob does. He gets Rachel before he does the seven years, but he has to work another seven years. And so then, okay, so then there's these two sisters are in this incredibly awkward 
situation. And then we read in verse 30 um, that Jacob uh, had Rachel as well. And then it says, he loved Rachel more than Leah. He loved Rachel more than Leah. So you can imagine, again, how must Leah have felt? The next verse says, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb and Rachel was barren. When the Lord saw the pain and the hurt of Leah, he blessed her. God sees the pain and the hurt that people go through. He sees your pain. He sees your hurt. He sees the unfair situation that you have going on at work. He sees the unfair situation that, you, uh, that might be going on in your family. He knows. And God has a plan for you. He will not ignore you. He opens up Leah's womb. In fact, the, the, the sons of um, Jacob, and then there's, there's four different mothers in the end. Uh, but Leah, Leah's sons really, uh, there's more uh, tribes of Israel from Leah than, than any other. So Leah is blessed in the end. God sees her pain and her hurt. So they start having children. Uh, it's interesting. They start having children. That's the one section. And there's the fight between the, the, the mothers and so on. That's a whole sordid story. But then the next story is Jacob moving on, right? I got all these kids. How am I going to make a living? And so Jacob manipulates his uncle to make uh, the sheep and the goats thing happen. And he's and God blesses him, even though he's, he's thinking he's doing it on his own. Uh, God blesses him, and he gets large enough to where Jacob is like, okay, it's time for us to go. He fights with his uncle about leaving. Uncle didn't want to le- lose him because uh, God blessed the uncle too. But in the end, he leaves. And so now he's going to go back home. And he's, he's a large... Uh, wealthy person with all this uh, cattle and so on and household servants and family and children. And he starts heading home. Uh, but again, there was no email. There was no like discussion on Facebook with his brother over this time. So he's coming home. He has no idea what to, what to expect. Esau finds out that he's coming home. And word gets to Jacob that Esau is coming with a bunch of armed men. And so he's afraid. How's this going to go? Esau, last time I saw him, he wanted to kill me. Maybe he still does. So he divides his people into two groups, and he goes across the Jabbok River. And then one of the weirdest things or little passages that we find in the Bible is he meets some guy and starts wrestling with him. Hey, who are you? I don't know. Let's wrestle. I don't know. I mean, I can see Esau doing that, right? Pulls up in his willies and gets out and he's got his camo on. Hey, come on, let's go. Um, but Jacob, although this kind of reminds me of my cousin. I just uh, had uh, dinner with my cousin last night and he's about two months younger than I am. And he, uh, he, uh, he was always really small when he was growing up. Now he's you know same size as I am, which isn't that big, but... Um, <laughs> But he was small, and, but he was a fighter. You know, he was a real, you know, always trying to prove himself kind of guy. And when he was like five years old, uh, this is the story that his mother always told, uh, they went to a truck stop or something like that, and they got out, and there was another five-year-old there that he didn't know, and he walked up to the five-year-old and punched him. Oh. And then the, the parents are like, what, what in the world are you doing? And he said, well, I had to hit him before he hit me. <laughs> so I, I expect that from Esau, but not Jacob. I mean, so how did they get into this wrestling match? I don't know, but, it, but somehow Jacob knew this was an angel or this was an angel in place of God or this was God or this was Jesus. Uh, it was someone uh, not of, uh, of human origin. So he's fighting and they're wrestling all night long. I mean... And in the end, you're just like, well, what are you wrestling about? And at the end, Jacob says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. 
I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And then the angel or God or whoever this was just touched his hip. Now, they've been wrestling. They've been touching, grabbing, and throwing, and smack downing, and all this stuff, and, and just touch. And his whole hip is dislocated. Now, what's, that's kind of a weird deal. And the, the angel does end up blessing Jacob. But what's this hip thing? I think the hip thing was God's way of, you know, you wrestle with stuff. You fight for things. You're trying to make things happen in life. But the power is in me. I just touch your hip and it's gone. You think you're making things happen out there, but it's, it's me that makes these things happen. And in this experience, he gets a new name. Jacob means deceiver. It means overreacher, trying to grab what you uh, perhaps don't have a right to. And he was grabbing, and all the people in his life, his brother, his dad, his uncle, uh, the whole... Uh, marriage thing, he's fighting at every step, trying to make a living, always fighting all the people around him. And here he's wrestling with God. And so he gets a new name. You're not going to be called Jacob anymore, you, you're going to be called Israel. El, at the end of the word Israel, means God. The first part is to wrestle with, to wrestle with God, to contend with God. So what does that mean for you and I? It means our tendency is to wrestle with everything around us and to fight for whatever it is that we're looking for or whatever it is that we want, fighting with the people around us. The whole world is filled with fighting. Every history, every political figure, they're always fighting with somebody. The world is filled with fighting. And we think by fighting with everyone around us that we're going to get what we want. The only real fight that we have in our lives is with God. We need to contend with God. We need to bring our stuff to Him and our problems and the things that we don't understand. We literally wrestle with God. We wrestle with God with what He wants us to do. God, what do you want me to do? This is a situation. I have no idea what to do. And I'm going to keep praying to you. I'm going to keep holding on to you until you tell me. We're looking for healing. We're looking for help. We're looking for answers. We're looking for a change in some relationship situation. God, you're the one that has to make this happen. And I'm going to wrestle with you until your will is made known in my life. That's the direction our lives go. Okay, so he wrestles and then... Esau comes, and he has no idea what's going to happen. And Esau comes, and when he sees his brother, they hug. They finally reconcile. And then some other things happen in his life, but that's sort of the end of the Jacob story. They wrestle. And it's sort of like uh, in the beginning, they were wrestling and fighting in the womb, nothing but fighting all this fighting and so on, and finally it ends with a hug. To let all that go, to let all the wrestling and all the fighting that we have going on and ultimately come into uh, where we're connected to uh, one another. That's really the goal in life. That's what, that's, what, that's what Jesus comes to do. It's to reconcile all this brokenness in our lives. So maybe you have brokenness in your life too. Maybe like Jacob, maybe like Esau. Maybe you can relate more to one. Maybe you can relate to the other. I don't know. But it's in Jesus that our fighting can be uh, reconciled. So bring your stuff to Him. So next week, we're going to be looking at the Joseph story. I hope that, uh, I hope that you're carving out a little bit of time to read this a little bit every day. If you're new visiting with us, we're following this abridged Bible uh, throughout the whole year. We're going to go through this thing in the whole year. You'll get a sense of the whole Bible at the end of this year. There's also a little booklet that goes with it. They're at the back table. They're over at the side table. If you're new here, take one. It's free, 
and inside there's the date and what you're supposed to read. There's a few questions for your family to do together. Uh, uh, so please do that. Let's pray together. Lord, some of us have tension in our lives, tension in our families, tension in our marriage. There's, there's, um, there's open warfare where harsh words are being said, or maybe it's the silent tre treatment, uh, or maybe one is sort of given up and doesn't care anymore, and the other is frustrated because the other's given up, and or there's uh, you know, a son or a daughter who just quietly wonders if, if parents actually um, believe in them or see anything good in them. We have all this brokenness uh, going on in our lives. Uh, help us bring these, this stuff to you. That you are the one that can work through the brokenness. That you are the one that can take brokenness and make us whole. And so we look to you as the one that can provide. Help us to wrestle with you. Help us to have the, the, the courage to do that. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we'll have the offering uh, this morning. We're going to have two offerings. The first offering is for Pathway Church, and the second offering is for the Pathway Church Mission Fund. So Pathway Church General Fund, then the Mission Fund, and we're going to sing from Proverbs, one of our scripture songs, um, while we do that. And we'll do it in the dark. <laughs> or not. Why don't you stand uh, as we do this? Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. Amen. We join us for fellowship through the double doors. If you're a visitor, make sure you get one of those books and the thing that goes with it. And if you need prayer, please come to the front.